I'm oral historian Mike Chappelle. Today, June 22nd, 2014, I'm interviewing Dr. Louis Braverman for the Endocrine Society at its annual meeting being held this year at the McCormick Place, Chicago. Lou, would you tell me a little bit about your family background? I'd be delighted to. Uh, my dad was uh, born and raised in New York and came to Quincy, Massachusetts, I think just before the Depression as a physician. He was a general practitioner and he had his office in the house with my mother as the major domo. He did not have a nurse, did not have a secretary, and she helped him uh, in the office. And my mother uh, was one of six children and came, and they were married in New York before they came to, to Quincy. What was it like growing up during the end of the Depression and the World War II years? Well, I, my favorite memories are the, my dad being paid with vegetables, chickens, eggs, because patients uh, did not have money in those days, as you don't remember, but as you know. And I can remember uh, my dad never sent a bill as long as he practiced medicine. And because his philosophy was that if they have the money, they'll pay, and if they don't have the money, they're not going to pay, so why bill? And this was, he had a family practice? He had a family. He was a family physician. His no appointments. The hours were from 2 to 3 in the afternoon, 7 to 8 in the evenings, except on Wednesday afternoon and evening, which was doctor's day off. And he had office hours on Saturday uh, from 2 to 4. What type of early education did you have? Well, I, I started out in the grammar school and public school in Quincy, and then I went to two years of junior high school and then uh, transferred uh, to Milton Academy so that I spent my last five years of secondary school at Milton as a day student, as a commuter. And I remember my dad used to drive me to, to, to school every morning and I'd come home on the bus until I became a little older and then I would take the bus even in the morning. And in my last year, I, he, got a, he bought me a car and I drove to school. What were your, what was your major uh, school interests? The general curriculum, you know, we had to take uh, Latin and French, science, math, English, athletics. So there was a pretty well-rounded, uh, small, small prep school. There were only 52 men, only boys in those days. They had a girls' school across the street. So there were only 52 of us, and of that class of 47, 20 five went to Harvard and one did not get in. So you can imagine it was a little bit different now than it was in those days. It was a direct line into, into Harvard. And you were one of the ones that got to Harvard. Yeah, I was one of the 25, but not the guy that didn't get into Harvard. And what was your major at Harvard? It, I was a biology major. Uh, and were you committed to a medical career at that point? Not really. I was thinking about it, but I wasn't sure at that point. And was there any professor that had a specific influence? Yeah, I think there, I think there was. Uh, I took a, a research, co a research uh, course in biology with Dr. Frederick Heisaw, who happened to be uh, an endocrinologist, a PhD, and he was the, in the 30s, he described a hormone called relaxin when he was a professor uh, as, I'm sorry, as a graduate student at the University of Missouri in Columbia, uh, relaxin is a hormone which makes the pubis synthesis uh, mobile so that he often wondered how moles could deliver their babies when they go into their hole. And what they did was relaxin, or uh, in those days it was called relaxin, made the synthesis pubis loose so that they could get into the hole to deliver their babies. So he was a giant in the field and had a, a coterie of outstanding younger faculty and graduate students, including Joe Villardo, Tom Smith, Hilton Salhanik, who was a major figure in the Endocrine Society later on in his career, he became a professor of obstetrics and gynecology at Harvard Medical School. So that was my first exposure, really, to endocrinology. As a matter of fact, my first paper was in 1953 when I was a second year medical student 
based on the work that uh, I did with Tom Smith at the Harvard Laboratories. Now, medical school, that was at Johns Hopkins. That was at Johns Hopkins. And how did you come to attend Johns Hopkins? Well, it's an interesting quick story. Uh, there was a, I had a good friend in my dormitory at Harvard in Dunster House, and he had gotten into Johns Hopkins, and I hadn't, I hadn't heard yet, and I'd been accepted at two other medical schools. And I said, uh, I, I asked Jim what I, what I should do, and he said, well, why don't you just send down a telegram and tell me you've been accepted at two other medical schools but you really wanted to come to Johns Hopkins. And I got back within 48 hours in acceptance. Mm -hmm. That's how loose it was in those days. And then when we went to medical school, I, my, first, uh, my second and third years, I roomed with Jim Allen, who was the guy that really told me what to do to get in. And did you meet your future wife at this point? Yes, I did. I, I, I met her through through a friend of uh, a young lady whom I knew in Quincy, who was the daughter of the mayor of Quincy, whom I knew when she was at prep school. And uh, she, I asked her to go out one day, and she said, no, I can't go, but I have a good friend at Vassar, Mimi. Why don't you call her? So that's how it all started. And then I fixed, him, I fixed her, though. I fixed her up with my roommate, Jim Allen, and they got married. So the two guys married the two gals from, from Vassar. That's, that's nice. Uh, let's see. Okay, then how did, you did your internship at Beth Israel in yes. Boston. How did you come to do it there? Well, I wanted to return to Boston because Mimi, my wife, was from, also from Boston, and her dad was a, in, in those days, was an associate professor of medicine at, at Harvard. And my family was also in Quincy, which is a suburb of, of Boston, so we wanted to return. And I applied to the, uh, to the, the Harvard hospitals and uh, did my internship at the Beth Israel. Um, what's the Berry Plan? The Berry Plan is, is, was a plan in, in, in those days. After the war, there was a shortage of physicians for the military. And uh, the, I, I don't remember what, I think he was the, public health director, Barry, or he may have been a congressman, I'm not sure. But at any rate, uh, he introduced into the Congress a bill that there was, what was, which was called the Berry Plan, which was a doctor's draft. Since there was a shortage of physicians, all physicians, all doctors in those days had to serve two years, either in the Army, the Navy, the Air Corps, Air Force, or they could go into the public health service and the Indian, and the Indian uh, service or they could go to the NIH. So all physicians in those days, and we're talking in the 50s, late 40s, 50s, and 60s, I'm not sure of the dates, but certainly in the 50s, had to go into the military or the public health service. So it was mandatory. So I went in after my internship. In those days, as you have probably heard from others, we worked every other night and every other weekend. And uh, at that point, at the end of my, my internship, I was really a tired guy and decided I'd get two years in the military out of the way. You could rest there? I could rest, yeah. As a matter of fact, we went to Fort Sam Houston for basic training. And you can imagine in those days of chubby, out of condition physicians going through obstacle courses at Fort Sam Houston in San Antonio. So we spent six weeks there and then uh, wanted to go to Europe and I, I lucked out and I had a, had a position in Metz, France uh, which is in the northeast corner of France, very famous for the battles in the First World War and in the Second World War, not too far from Verdun. And our dispensary, I was a general medical officer, and our dispensary was the site of the old stables of General Pershing's army in the First World War. So it was really a stable, pretty crude. Now, after your service in the military service was taken care of, uh, how did you decide to do your residency at uh, Boston City Hospital? Well, I, when I was in France, and in those days, the telephone connections were barely available, and uh, letters were the only way one could really communicate with people back at home, back home. So I was accepted to do a research fellowship at the Beth Israel Deaconess, but really wanted to have a residency at the Thorndike Laboratories at the Boston City Hospital. So after I'd accepted a job 
at the Beth Israel with Dr. Howard Hyatt, who later became the dean of the School of Public Health at Harvard. After I had accepted the position, apparently one of the residents on the Harvard service at the Harvard unit at the Boston City Hospital and the Thorndike Laboratories, one of the residents passed away. And I got a, a telegram from Max Finland, who was the co-director of the service at that time, asking me if I would like to take that, uh, that gentleman's position. He didn't tell me why. I, I found that out when I got back, and I accepted and then had the problem of now turning down a job that I'd already accepted uh, at the Beth Israel Deaconess, which was a very difficult decision. But I'm so pleased that I went to the Thorndike and the Harvard unit. So that was where you really wanted to end up anyway? Yes. And why was that? What? Because they had a, there was a city hospital taking care of, uh, of, the, of the poor, and it was a big, booming teaching hospital connected with the Harvard unit was one unit, and the Thorndike Laboratories was one of the premier research uh, sections or research departments in the country in American medicine. As a matter of fact, they, in those days, and even up until they, they faded out, phased out from the Boston City Hospital in seven, 1974, they had trained more professors of medicine and chairs of departments of medicine than any other medical school in the United States, I think including Hopkins. So it was a, it was a great place to, to be, a huge metropolitan hospital, 12, 1,400 beds, Three medical schools were there at the same time, Harvard, Tufts, and BU. And they were renowned for their teaching, their research, and clinical care. When you got there, did you, what was your uh, initial goal at that point? Just I mean, to, to survive the two, <laughs> the two for next years of residency. So I didn't know what I was going to do. No, I didn't know what I was going to do at that point. Okay. And what happened then to, to uh, help you? Figure out what well, yeah, what happened in the beginning of the second year of residency, which would be, uh, I guess, in 1959, I had decided that I would do infectious disease fellowship with Max Finland, who was the guru and probably the most illustrious infectious disease expert in the world, let alone the United States. And at, at, at the middle of that year, in the summer of my, my second year of residency, I met with Sid Ingbar, who was the head of endocrinology at that time, and he and I just had a wonderful relationship. And, he, and I had had this, little, uh, had this background in endocrinology when I was an undergraduate at college in the Hysol laboratory. And so I, I worked with Sid, and, I, and Max Finland was just as a, a, a wonderful guy, and he just said, Lou, if that's what you want to do, it's no problem. And so that's how I, I started. And my second part of my second year of residency, I worked in, with Sid in his laboratory and stayed on for another two years. And then, then you got a research fellowship. Did that just come naturally? Out? Yeah, in those days, they, they were such a powerhouse that that almost came naturally. The, uh, they had support from the NIH, so I was on an NIH fellowship during my, during my fellowship years. And would you say a little bit more about uh, Sidney Ingbar and his scientific yeah, stature? Sid, yeah. uh, Sid was, a, was a, as, as you probably know, was president of the Endocrine Society and had every, president of the American Thyroid Association and had every honor, I believe, worldwide. He was a wonderful guy, was uh, close to a genius. He graduated, of, I believe, from college at 19 and uh, medical school, uh, not too far, uh, accelerated in medical school because of military, the army, the, everything, clo everything was, during the war, the latter part of the war, the uh, medical school was condensed to three years. So he got out of medical school at a very young age and was a, he, in those days, a wonderful guy and a superb investigator and wrote, wrote like Shakespeare. Uh, Boston, in that period, uh, there were, it was like a, a hotbed of thyroidology. There, there were a number of, not just uh, the Thorndike and not just Sidney Bar. Could you say a little bit about what it was like then? It was, it was a hotbed of, of thyroid research. There was John Stanbury and his group at the Mass General, and Farah Maloof was part of that group, as was Lester Groot 
really giants in thyroid uh, research and basic, both clinical and basic research. And then there was uh, Dr. Astwood at, uh, at, at Tufts, uh, and he was a giant also in the field. Uh, as a matter of fact, was the discoverer of the antithyroid drug uh, propylthiouracil. And so that there was a lot of action in the thyroid at both, uh, at both the Mass General, New England Medical Center in Tufts, and the Thorndike. And did you have much interaction with the other groups, or were you on your own? It was interesting. Uh, you know, looking back, I think there was a, a, a lot of competition, although it wasn't overt. And everyone got along well, but there was not much in the way of interchange research-wise between the uh, three major centers. Which is interesting, uh, and I think it probably, that probably still exists in the United States today. Competition is one thing, and being a good friend, you can have, be a competitor and still be good friends. Everyone got along fine, but there was, uh, there was not much interplay. Let's see, why did you, uh, le why did you, let's see, you left Thorndike in 62 yes. uh, for St. Elizabeth's. Uh, how did that come about? Well, that came about because a, a friend of mine, Tom Ryan, who, who was a fellow at the Thorndike in cardiology, had gone over to St. Elizabeth's the year before. And he established a, really a, a full-time cardiology section at St. Elizabeth's, which is a major affiliate of Tufts. And so he said, why don't you come over if, uh, and, and start an endocrine section? And uh, essentially that's what happened. So that I went over there. Uh, uh, in 62, in July of 62, to be the first chief of endocrinology at St. Elizabeth's, which, as I said, was a major affiliate of Tufts, and that's how I, we got to know uh, Cy Reichland and the group over at the New England Medical Center at Tufts. Now, how did, how did you divide your day or your week at that time? Well, I think I had gotten my first and only NIH grant beginning when, at the year that I went over there, so I was very fortunate in those days. I think it was a lot easier to get funding from the NIH in those days, so I spent a lot of my time uh, in the laboratory doing mostly rat, re rat research, uh, but then also saw patients uh, Saturday morning is when I saw some patients and t you know, did teaching of the residents who rotated through not only from uh, New England Medical Center, but uh, St. Elizabeth's had their own internal medicine residence. And so that I spent my time, as, as I think I'm doing now, in doing research teaching and patient care, but in those days, much more rat and bench research than obviously that I'm doing now. How were you recruited to the University of Massachusetts Medical Center in 1975? What happened in 19, the year before, 19, <clears throat> excuse me, in 1974, the chief of medicine at uh, St. Elizabeth's was a, a, a really a wonderful guy named Fred Stolman, who had come from the NIH and was my first boss when I went to St. Elizabeth's. And he was the, he discovered a hormone erythropoietin. Uh, so he was a major leader and had a huge laboratory at that time. In 1974, he and his wife were returning from a meeting in, I believe, in Egypt, and they flew to Athens, and they went from Athens to Rome to be met by his former fellows and colleagues in, in Rome, and that was the plane you may, you probably don't remember, that was blown up by the terrorists going from Athens to Rome, and all of, everybody on the plane, including Fred and his wife, went down into the Adriatic Sea so that it was a major disaster. So when Fred, after Fred died, it was a very sad time at St. Elizabeth's. And uh, at that, shortly thereafter, Roger Hickler, whom I knew vaguely, became chairman of the new medical school in Worcester at the University of Massachusetts. And uh, he recruited me to come. It was a tough decision to make. Had, had a wonderful time at St. Elizabeth's for the 13 years that I was there. Everyone was extremely kind and, and, and helpful to me, including the nuns who ran the, uh, to run, ran the hospital. Uh, and so it was a difficult decision, but decided that it was a, another opportunity to be at a medical school, beginning at a, a new medical school. And so I went in 75, and as, as is from my CV, as you 
probably know I stayed until 1997 as chief of endocrinology and also chair of the Department of Nuclear Medicine. And d you said you pretty much kept the same division of your time while you were there? Yes, I did. Uh, let's see. Now, did you acquire knowledge and skills in molecular biology at this time? No. <laughs> yes. Okay, and, well. and, 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 it's, and it's very, it's very, very soft knowledge, okay. I must say. But no, I, mostly we were doing primarily, uh, as you can see, as you have probably seen from my big bib and CV, we were primarily doing physiology in rats, woodchucks, uh, guinea pigs, and uh, did human, human physiological studies uh, related to the thyroid. So oh, that I was not a molecular biologist and did not have any training in the theory. I'll ask you a little bit more about your research when we get to that section. Okay. Um, then you became, uh, oh no, then you were recruited to the Boston University School of Medicine. Yeah, was that was 1999. Yeah, there was an interim period. In 1990, I left UMass in 1997 because we had moved from Newton, which is a western suburb of Boston, which made the, the commute to Worcester not too bad. It was about a 45-minute commute, and we had a carpool. There were four of us in the carpool, so I only really drove uh, daily for about a week at a, every four weeks. So that, uh, anyway, we moved into Boston, into the back bay, and that added another 15 minutes to the, my commute. Also, the carpool disintegrated. Uh, Dr. Vianakis, who we'll come to later, went to Greece, uh, and Cynthia Abreu, who was also part of the, the uh, also part of the carpool, went to BU, and it left uh, left the carpool decimated. And Irma Zamansky, who was the hematologist who was in the carpool, she dropped out. So that, mean I had to, that meant I have to, had to drive myself, and it got to be too much. So I decided that I would relocate to Boston. And that was at the time when I went to the Brigham for a couple of years under the auspices of Bill Chin, who offered me a, a position at the Brigham to continue to do teaching, research, and, and uh, clinical care. Maybe now was a good time to talk about your major lines of research, mm -hmm. uh, starting with the Wolf Chekhov mm -hmm. effect. Uh, but first, maybe you could give me just a general uh, state of the art of thyroidology uh, beginning in the 1960s when I think you. Yeah. I think it was a, most, of the, uh, most of the art and the science at that time was primarily physiology because molecular biology was just its in, in its infancy. So there was a lot of interest in the, in the physiology, the control of thyroid function, the metabolism of the thyroid hormones and peripheral tissues, uh, rather than uh, molecular biology, and also not much interest in thyroid cancer, interestingly enough, because it was a, a disorder that uh, was not lethal to most people and uh, was well managed, even in those days. So that I, I think uh, it was mostly physiology. And what did they uh, know about the physiology at that, right before, you know, in the early period there? Well, you, I mean, had they discovered um, what hormones did they did they know? Well, as far as the thyroid is concerned, the assays for thyroxine T4, triiodothyronine T3, and TSH were not available in the early days, and it was only during the next 50, 10 or 15 years that these assays became available for study. So that uh, it was mostly measuring protein-bound iodine as a, as a surrogate for the circulating thyroid hormone. What is the wolf checkoff effect? It's an interesting, it's an interesting effect. It, it was described originally by Wolf and Chekhov when Jan Wolf was a graduate student in Chekhov's laboratory at the University of California in, uh, L, in, in um, Los Angeles, not in Los Angeles, I'm sorry, University of California in Berkeley. And uh, they, de they described the a process in the rat in which excess iodine given over the course of a, of a few days, if one then took out the rat thyroid, you'd find that there was, for about 24 hours, 
a subtle decrease in the amount of organic iodine within the gland. They couldn't measure hormones in those days. They couldn't measure T4 and T3, so they had no idea uh, exactly what it was, but they knew it was hormonal iodine. And then as the, as the rats were continued on these high doses of iodine and the thyroids were removed, normal thyroid hormone synthesis apparently began again. The organic iodine content rose back to ba a baseline. And that was called the acute wolf chakoff effect. And that is really what, that acute effect, if that continued, we'd all become hypothyroid, as would the rats, if they didn't adapt and escape from the effects of excess iodine. So within 24 hours in the rat, and probably a couple of days longer in humans, in spite of the fact that there are huge amounts of iodine in the blood, the thyroid resumes normal thyroid function again, and that's called the escape or adaptation to the acute wolf chakoff effect. And again, if that didn't happen, you or I would become hypothyroid if given too much iodine, as would rats and other rodents and animals. So those, those were the, that was the basis, and those papers came out in endocrinology, I believe, in 1947, 1948. And uh, the mechanism of why this happened, what, why did the thyroid escape from these adverse effects of excess iodine remained unclear. And then what questions did you ask about it? Well, in my last two years of fellowship, uh, we, Sid, Sid Ingbar and I, and under his direction, uh, looked into the, what made the escape happen. And we did some studies in the rat and took out the rat's thyroid, incubated them with radioactive iodine, and in conclusion decided and published in endocrinology, I believe, in the journal Endocrinology, I believe in 1963, that the escape from the acute wolf chakoff effect was due to some, something happened, and excess iodine just didn't get into the thyroid. So that even though it was present in the media, in the studies that we did, and in the blood in, in rats and humans, for reasons that were unclear at that time, the thyroid just stopped bringing in the excess iodine. The iodine trap dropped dramatically. And that what protected the rats, that's what we postulated. And that's the way it lay fallow for many, many years after. Now, when you publish those results, how were they accepted in the, uh, well, in the thyroid community? Or they, I think they were accepted reasonably well. As a matter of fact, it was the basis for my being awarded the, uh, uh, the, an award from the American Thyroid Association uh, for, for that, just for that piece of work uh, in 1963. As a matter of fact, the, it happened in Chicago at the American Thyroid Association annual meeting in 1968. Uh, 1963. And were there therapeutic or public health uh, implications from this work at that time? At that time, probably not, except that it offered a, a partial explanation of why we didn't, why we don't get into trouble when we take too much iodine in our in our diet or or take it for medi for medicine's purpose. Let's see. Now, what I want to we'll jump ahead now to uh, I guess the 1990s when uh, we'll talk about the sodium uh, iodide symporter and and how you tied that together with your earlier work. You know what that, that that's a, a super question because what happened in 1995, I believe uh, Nancy Carrasco and her group published for the first time the, the sodium iodide symporter. They cloned this molecule, which was responsible for trapping iodine from the blood into the thyroid at a very, very high gradient of about 40 to 1. So that looking back on the work that, that we did back in, the, in my fellowship and published in 1963, if the postulate would be if, could this, let me put it this way, could the sodium iodide symporter be the mechanism whereby 
the iodine stopped coming into the thyroid when, it, when the, there was a lot of iodine in the plasma. So that when I went to the Brigham working in, in Bill Chin's laboratory, there was a, a, a wonderful uh, uh, fellow from Singapore at that time, uh, Peter Eng, and uh, he was assigned by Bill and by me to reinvestigate the wolf chakoff effect. So he repeated exactly the same studies that we had done in 1960s, except now could look at circulating T4, T3 in the rat, T4, T3, and TSH, and now, following Carrasco's work, could now measure the protein, the sodium iodide symporter, responsible for the trapping of iodine into the thyroid. And what uh, Peter essentially found was that within 24 hours in the rat, the, so the sodium iodide symporter markedly decreased. Therefore, in spite of the fact that the rats were continually given iodine, they no longer brought in excess amounts, and, and we now believe that the mechanism for the escape is due to a marked reduction in the sodium iodide symporter, the protein responsible for the iodine trap from blood into the thyroid uh, to markedly decrease. And that was published, I believe, in 1999 uh, or so. Now, was that? So that closed the loop was that, for us. Now, in that time period before Nancy Carrasco um, came up with the sodium uh, iodide symporter, was that something you were waiting for, or were you like, did it come out of the blue for you? Or? It came out of the blue, and, uh, and it was it really, uh, I guess we owe Nancy a lot. She's now at Yale, uh, by the way, moved from Albert Einstein to, uh, to, to Yale within the last year or two. Yeah, I think the availability of, uh, of the mechanisms to measure the sodium iodide symporter uh, really gave us an opportunity to finally, I think, n put a nail in the coffin of what happens in the, in the escape process. Did you realize that right away as soon as you heard it? Heard yeah, so, yeah. We, once, we, once we realized that that protein was available to measure, uh, then it struck us to relook at the, uh, at the wolf chakoff effect. And it's unfortunate that uh, Sid Ingbar passed away at a very young age in 1988, so he wasn't available and wasn't alive to see the, the closing of what I think is probably the closing of the circle. And I'm sure that there are other aspects of that whole escape mechanism which is yet to be determined, but at least we think that that's one of the major reasons for why we don't get into trouble with excess iodine. Uh, can we talk about your iodine st studies now? What was the state of the art, or what were some of the key issues when you began your iodine studies? The, the, the question in those days uh, for, was a major worldwide problem of iodine deficiency. And goiter with iodine deficiency, iodine deficiency goiter was a worldwide public health problem leading to a marked uh, increase in the prevalence of cretinism and mental retardation worldwide. So that iodine uh, became uh, a major focus of the WHO uh, as well as the organization to, uh, to uh, prevent iodine deficiency worldwide, the ICIDD. So uh, over the last 20 to 25 years, there's been a major effort to reduce iodine deficiency worldwide. And they've, it's not quite finished, but made major strides in reducing iodine deficiency and reducing the prevalence worldwide of goiter and mental retardation. Were, were those problems when you got, first got into in the United States too? No, I think we were relatively iodine sufficient, but in the 1920s around the Great Lakes region, there was, was large belts of iodine deficiency with goiter. Uh, and this was early studies by David Marine and others had determined that iodine deficiency was a major cause of goiter and, uh, and re mental retardation. Around the Great Lakes? Yeah, yeah especially, point. yeah. In Ohio and in that whole basin, it was iodine deficiency probably due to the decreased iodine in the environment, in the natural environment. 
Now, what initial questions were you asking about iodine? Well, we originally we did the, the studies involved with the wolf chakoff effect. Oh, by the way, I might add that on my, my last recollection, Jan Wolf is uh, still active, I think, at the NIH doing research. So you can imagine uh, how, which may speak well for thyroidologists that some of us managed to hang on longer than we probably should. But he, uh, he's a, an amazing guy and has done, had done great work over the course of many, many years. Could you tell me a little bit more about your iodine studies? Yes, I, I can. Uh, the other aspect of this is not only iodine deficiency, but is too much iodine detrimental to certain patients or certain people who have underlying thyroid disease. So we did some uh, many studies uh, over the course of many years looking at the effects of excess iodine in normal individuals and those individuals who have underlying thyroid disease such as chronic thyroiditis, a history of Graves' disease, a history of postpartum lymphocytic thyroiditis, a previous uh, treatment with interferon alpha, and so that patients who have had a lobectomy or half their thyroid removed, would these patients not escape, would some of them not escape from the acute wolf jakoff effect and develop hypothyroidism, uh, which uh, does not occur, as we mentioned earlier, in normal individuals and in, in rat models. And so that we looked at patients and individuals who'd had all of these underlying thyroid disorders and found that those patients who have a wide variety of underlying thyroid disease when exposed to excess iodine may develop hypothyroidism, don't escape from the acute wolf chakoff effect. And there is also another group who have nodular non-toxic goiters especially in areas of the world where there's mild iodine deficiency, when iodine repletion occurs or when excess iodine is given, might develop uh, something called yod bacidow's disease or iodine-induced thyrotoxicosis, described initially by Bazidow uh, in Germany in the 19th century. So that's why many of our publications uh, have evolved over the course of many years looking at the effects of excess iodine on thyroid function, uh, especially those patients who might develop hypothyroidism. What are the current trends or recommendations or public health implications regarding iodine nutrition in the United States? In the U.S., I think is reasonably iodine sufficient, except that there are groups, subgroups of individuals who might be, uh, might be at risk and those are pregnant women and women in childbearing age where the iodine intake in this country in, in, may be a little lower than it should be and about 15 to 20 percent of repro women in their reproductive age uh, might, be, uh, might have mild iodine uh, deficiency. And so that it's important uh, for both the fetus and the mother to be sure that, that a normal amount of iodine is available. And during pregnancy and lactation and breastfeeding, the iodine requirements rise. Uh, need, you need more iodine uh, in those situations. So that uh, there, there is a concern in the United States, even in the United States, and it's been recommended very recently uh, that all prenatal vitamins be supplemented with about 150 micrograms of potassium iodide. And that the women, women who are planning pregnancy or who are pregnant or who in the postpartum period are nursing should take a vitamin pill which contains about 150 micrograms of potassium or sodium iodine. But that's not mandated as yet. Now, if there was a problem with iodine uh, in the United States, either too much or too little, how long would that, how would that become apparent? How, how, how long would that take, um, would it, you know, for, for medicine to realize that that was a problem and to, to do something 
public health wise to correct it? Yeah, I, I think in the, as I said, in the 20s and 30s, uh, the whole issue of the teens in the 20s and 30s, especially in the mid part of the United States where goiter was very prevalent, uh, was recognized that it was iodine, uh, low iodine intake, and so that that was led to the, led to the supplementation of iodine, and certainly in those areas. But I, I think that it has become a public, it's a public health issue rather than anything else. And it's been difficult, and hopefully in the very near future, the various organizations associated with taking care of pregnant women and endocrinologists will mandate or at least strongly recommend uh, that all prenatal vitamins contain iodine to just avoid any possibility of decreased iodine intake, which could affect both the fetus and, and in some, if it's a severe enough, uh, complications of pregnancy. Now, you've done some studies on iodine content in fast foods and mm -hmm. uh, also, well, maybe just give me a comment on on the content of iodine in fast foods. Well, yeah, the, when Sun Lee, who's now a fellow uh, at, with us at Boston University uh, in the section of endocrinology, when she was a resident, did a very nice study and just collected hamburgers from McDonald's and uh, Burger King, and we looked at the iodine content, and except for one, uh, one uh, bun, uh, all of them were iodine. So that if people, and, and as you know, teenagers especially, but young people eat a lot of fast foods, and the fast food industry does not use, routinely use iodized salt when they produce their, the contents of their diet, so that if you really live on, an, on, a, on a fast food diet, the chances are you're going to become iodine deficient. Uh, so this was, uh, and it's not been mandated, but probably there's a lot of action to try to get the fast food industry to use iodized salt. It's not a major issue, but I think it's a financial issue, is that it costs more to have iodized salt than it does non-iodized salt. Now you also did study on vegetarians and vegans? Yeah, 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 right. Angela Leong, who's now left us, unfortunately, and is now an assistant professor at the University of California, the VA hospital in, in LA. Uh, Angela did a wonderful study uh, and collected urines from a group of vegetarians and a group of vegans and measured their iodine content, which uh, we do in our, routinely in our laboratory, and found that the vegetarians were okay. They just about made what is needed, but the vegans had about half the amount of iodine in their urine as one would recommend. So that if you're a vegan, you should also take a vitamin pill that has 150 micrograms of iodine. So the vegans, and that's a, that, you know, if you look around the United States now, there are a lot of young, I think young women and young men, but more young women, I think, who are vegans, and they run the risk of iodine deficiency and certainly if they're planning pregnancy, uh, they either should get off the vegan diet or certainly supplement uh, with an iodine-rich uh, vitamin pill. Now, over the years in your iodine studies, you've mentioned a few, but uh, who have been your main collaborators or, or fellows in, the, in that area? Yeah, well, I think uh, Dr. Apostolos Vianakis uh, was, uh, uh, many years ago, was a major played a major role, and he was a fellow with us and then was a faculty member at Tufts and then came to, with me to Worcester uh, and became a professor of medicine there. And in 1980, Apostolos was offered the job as the chairman of medicine at a new medical school in Patras, Greece, his home country. So he left, but he played a major role. He then rose to be not only chair of uh, medicine, but became dean of the medical school in Patras. Uh, so he, he left, but he was certainly uh, a, major, a major contributor to the early iodine studies. And of course, nowadays, uh, in the last decade or so, Elizabeth Pierce, who's now an associate professor of medicine and a former fellow at BU, uh, is taking, take, is handed, I've handed off the, the reins to her and, at, at BU, and then Angela Leong, I mentioned earlier, 
is now out in, in LA and uh, those are the those two very in the last decade have been the a major help to me and have been outstanding in keeping up this area of interest. Now we could switch maybe to the your work on the peripheral metabolism. Okay. Uh, what was the state of the art and some of the key issues when you began your work on thyroid hormone metabolism, especially the deionation pathway? Yeah, that, uh, Let me, I give you a little bit of the background. Yeah. I believe that it was John Stanbury and Rosalind Pitt Rivers in the 50s had described in a, in a paper in the JCNM, as a matter of fact, I believe, uh, that T4 can be converted to T3 in peripheral tissues and that this may be a major source of our circulating uh, T3 concentration, triethylamine being the active bi uh, biological hormone, whereas T4 is a, determined to be a pro-hormone. And unfortunately, about two years later, they retracted that paper and said that they found that it was probably an artifact. And so then, when I was working with Sid, after my fellowship, we became interested in the, uh, the of what, where does T3 come from? And at that time, there were no assays for triiodothyronine, so you couldn't really measure it. Uh, the, the early studies by Stanbury and Pitt Rivers uh, had been done using isotope, isotopic techniques. Well, Ken Sterling in New York developed an assay, a chroma, chromatographic assay for measuring T3 in human serum. And so this gave us a great opportunity to relook at the issue of conversion of T4 to T3 in peripheral tissues. So Sid and I and most of the, uh, decided that we would relook re at this again. And remember, this was in the 50s when they had retracted. And they were right the first time, by the way. Uh, uh, and it wasn't until the 60s, late 60s, when Ken Sterling in New York had developed this assay for measuring T3, which was not available uh, prior to that time. We did a, a study when I was at St. Elizabeth's uh, where we took patients who had no thyroid. They had histories of cancers of the thyroid, so they had no thyroid tissue. They had been ablated after surgery with radioactive iodine. They were on stable amounts of levothyroxine or thyroxine. And so it occurred to us that since they don't have a thyroid, why not measure their serum T3 while they're taking their pure T4? And if you found T3 in the blood, then it had to come from peripheral conversion of T4 to T3 because they don't have a thyroid to make T3. So it was a very simple study, but uh, difficult in a way to do. So what we did... Looking backwards. It's looking, simple. yeah, that's right. When you had to think it up, it was... Yeah, and, it was, and with the availability of an assay for T3, uh, this made the, the whole thing feasible. Mm -hmm. So when I was at St. Elizabeth's, uh, we took a group of athyreotic patients, gave them pure T4, uh, and measured, took their blood and measured uh, T3 and T4 in their blood. We didn't have the assay. Ken Sterling had the assay, so I would send. We would send down uh, An uh, Angela, one of my, uh, not Angela Leong, but uh, Angela, who was a, uh, a research technician in our lab. We would freeze the sera samples of about ten, say ten patients, and get her on the Northeast Airlines plane from Boston to New York, and she would be met by Ken Sterling at the airport in LaGuardia. And as she described it in those days, it was a hair-breaking, frightening, disastrous ride. He drove like a maniac going from the airport to the Bronx VA hospital. And then, Is that because he was so excited? No, because, because he's, I think, he, I think he's because he was a wild driver, I suspect. Had nothing to do with anything else. And he was, he, was a, he was a wonderful guy. Anyway, then he measured T3 in those serum samples. And lo and behold, he found lots of T3. So that paper was published in the JCI and was really the first paper describing unequivocally the conversion of T4 to T3. And, and now, as how was that received? 
that was received that was received well except i presented that paper at the endocrine society meeting i think in 1968 or 9 in new york at the old biltmore hotel and sitting in the front row uh, was jack oppenheimer who was a really a giant in the field of thyroidology including the whole issue of conversion of T4 to T3 and other areas of thyroid. Jack was a, a wonderful scientist and he was sitting in the front row and he was a little bit older than I was and I presented the paper, the conversion paper, and Jack, if I recall his exact words, stood up in the question and answer period. And in those days, I might add, the meetings were much more, in a way, friendly, confrontational. People would argue and it was exciting, but nowadays it's just too bland. At any rate, Jack stood up and said, Lou, he said, it's all an artifact. So, which is what Pitt Rivers said. <laughs> well, yeah, which is what, yeah, which they thought back, and he said, I don't believe it. And I said, well, you know, this is the data. <laughs> and as a matter of fact, I think two years later, Jack repeated the studies, similar studies, and termed that term the, made the, dis, the description of thyroxin as a pro-hormone for T3. So he came full, full over and, uh, and agreed that uh, this, was a, this was the major source. As a matter of fact, it's now believed that about 80% of our circulating T3 triiodothyronine, the bioactive thyroid hormone comes from conversion. And under normal circumstances, only about 20% from the thyroid itself. So there was a lot of excitement uh, at that time with a lot of rivalry. And then, Did you hear from Rosalind Pitt Rivers? At, no, we, no, we never did. And uh, uh, John Stanbury, of course, uh, is in, was in Boston. And as a matter of fact, you know, John Stanbury just celebrated his 99th birthday uh, living in a, 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 a retirement uh, 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 village in uh, right outside of Boston with his lovely wife. So he's still going. Mm -hmm. So that's how, that bodes well for again, thyroidologists. Again, again, yeah. Right. So you did those studies, those were with Sid, Sidney Ingbar? Mm -hmm. Yes. Yeah. Was the there anybody issue? else? No, it was Ingbar, me, and Sterling. And oh, I Sterling. think. Yeah, and uh, I remember after the paper was presented in New York, we sat in, a, in Sid Ingbar's room, and uh, they both smoked incessantly in those days, Ken with his cigars, and Sid was an uh, was a d addicted cigarette smoker, two to three packs a day. And eventually, as a matter of fact, Sid Ingbar died of, a bre of a thyroid, of, um, I'm sorry, of lung cancer, as did his wife. Uh, years later, and it may have been secondary smoke, I don't know. But anyway, we sat in the room, the three of us, and I was by far the most junior. And uh, the room was filled with smoke, with Ken's cigars and Sid's cigarettes. And there was a big discussion of the authorship. Who's going to be first, second, and third? And being the junior guy, I just sat there, I said nothing. <laughs> And Ken said, well, he said, I should be first author because it was my assay, the T3. Assay, you brought the blood to me. I should be first author. And Sid said, no, Ken, I think Lou should be first author because he did all the work. And this went on back and forth for maybe 20 minutes. Finally, it was agreed that I would be first author. So then the next question came up is, who's going to be the third author, which would be the most senior person. And there was a debate about that. And Sid said, OK, lose first author, and I'll give you the third authorship. So it was Braverman, Ingbar, Sterling were the sequential authors of that paper. But it was a meeting and a session that I'll never forget uh, to this day. But that two was... giants mm -hmm. you know, really going to battle over an issue which, uh, which was probably not very, not very important. But to them and to me, it was important. How, how did it affect your career to be first, would you no, think? No, it didn't matter, didn't matter at matter. that point. No, I don't think so. Uh, what is Amy Oderone? Amy Oderone is an iodine-rich 
uh, antiarrhythmic cardiac drug. And as we mentioned earlier, it has lots of iodine. And the drug is a superb medication for, uh, for controlling cardiac tachyarrhythmias. And my, many patients are on amiodarone uh, and, and remained in normal sinus rhythm uh, during the treatment uh, with amiodarone. But it has a prolonged half-life. It's lipid soluble. It's, it's sequestered into fat cells and has a half-life of about six months, so that once you take it, the iodine is there for a long, long time. And the interest in amiodarone was, again, going back to the iodine issue, uh, that so much iodine, would it affect thyroid function? And in studies done following my sabbatical uh, in Pisa, during my experience for six months in Pisa working with Aldo Pinquera, and Enio Martino at the University of Pisa, uh, where they had a, a, a tremendous interest in, in, in iodine and amiodarone, uh, began a long saga of studies on amiodarone. And the first paper that we did together, I believe, came out in the Annals of Internal Medicine in 1984, where we described the occurrence of iodine-induced thyroid dysfunction in patients on amiodarone. And in the United States, the prevalence of hypothyroidism was much higher than the prevalence in Italy. And on the other hand, the prevalence of iodine-induced hyperthyroidism, the old yod bacidal uh, problem, was more common in Italy, probably due to the difference in ambient iodine intake between the two countries in those days, where Italy was still mildly to moderately iodine deficient where in this country we were, we were doing pretty well with iodine sufficiency. So that, that paper came out, as I said, in the annals and was one of the early papers on the effects of, of amiodarone iodine-induced thyroid dysfunction. Amiodarone also has another interesting uh, uh, effect. It, it impairs or decreases the conversion of T4 to T3. And it's been postulated, but probably not the case, that maybe the antiarrhythmic effects are due to the fact that there's less T3 in the hearts of these patients due to the block of the decrease in conversion of T4 to T3 in cardiac muscle. Have there been changes then in, because of your paper on this in terms of how it's prescribed? Or? No, but I think, I think those initial studies and also have been followed up by many studies after that by others. Uh, equally, even more important. Uh, yeah, I think what it, what it has strongly suggested is that thyroid function should be carried out in all patients before they go on amiodarone and at least every couple of months after they start amiodarone to look out for the potential thyroid effects of the, of the medication. If they develop hypothyroidism, you don't have to stop the amiodarone, you just stay, can stay on it, you give them a thyroid hormone replacement. Uh, so that would be relatively easy. You have to give them a little more than they would normally need because of the effects of amiodarone on decreasing conversion of T4 to T3. On the other hand, the, the consequences of amiodarone-induced hyperthyroidism is much more, much more dangerous for the patient is that these are cardiac patients, and if they develop hyperthyroidism, that would certainly aggravate their underlying uh, problem. And there are two types of amiodarone-induced uh, thyrotoxicosis. One is an inflammatory reaction secondary to the amiodarone itself, and the second is iodine-induced, again, hyperthyroidism, secondary to the excess iodine. And uh, in, in Europe, uh, as I said earlier, it's, uh, the, uh, the type one or the goiter, the iodine-induced hyperthyroidism is uh, more common than in this country where we have the inflammatory thyroiditis uh, form of the disease more frequently seen. What are your current or most recent efforts in the amiodarone? It's interesting, very recently uh, we published a paper with uh, primarily uh, the work done by, uh, Amy, by Dr. Martino and his colleagues in Pisa 
the fact that amiodarone also can affect cl clotting times in patients who are on warfarin. And uh, so that one must be very careful when you give amiodarone, since these are cardiac patients who are on anticoagulants, that you have to be very careful of the, uh, to readjust the dose. And if there's a genetic defect in the handling of warfarin and the patient goes on amiodarone, uh, the clotting times and, and bleeding episodes can occur very, very quickly. So th we're still periodically looking at amiodarone. The APISA group has done a lot more uh, over the last decade uh, in this area on, on the effects of amiodarone. But it is a problem because it's a great cardiac drug. As a matter of fact, patients in some, some uh, EMT uh, arrivals, when someone's having a coronary or a heart attack or an arrhythmia, they will immediately inject IV amiodarone in the house or on the way to the hospital. So that it's a, it, I think it's gonna continue to be a, a thyroid issue as well as a cardiac issue. Would you talk a little bit about the development of recombinant human TSH? Sure. Yeah, the thyrogen or the recombinant human TSH was a genzyme uh, product, and my first uh, my first association uh, with this was time. My guy's name slipped out of my mind. Would you talk a little bit about the development of recombinant human? TSH. Yes, I'd be pleased to. I, I remember uh, I got a call from Paul Jellop, who was one of the uh, junior executives at, at Genzyme, interested in, in thyrogen or recombinant human TSH. And Paul had surreptitious, surreptitiously, I think a couple of the guys working there had taken, re-injected themselves with the thyrogen, thinking that it would lower serum cholesterol. But it didn't do it, of course. So he called and said, would we measure it? And I said, sure, and it didn't happen. At any rate, uh, that led to our first study uh, in primates of the effect of thyrogen or the recombinant human TSH uh, to stimulate the primate thyroid so that Chris Longcope, who had come over from the Worcester Foundation, I recruited him when I went to, to Worcester as chief there, uh, and I did a study, and I might parenthetically add that unfortunately Chris has passed away, but he became a good friend, and his father was the Warfield Longcope, and he was chairman of the Department of Medicine at Hopkins for many, many, many years, I believe in the 30s, but that's just parenthetical. He, he was a wonderful, wonderful guy and a great investigator, primarily interested in steroids. But at any rate, uh, he had a monkey he had monkeys at, uh, at the Worcester Foundation, and there were a few monkeys at the medical school, and what we did was, uh, with Chris, we injected monkeys with thyrogen and did radioactive iodine uptakes on their thyroids before and after. So now, was this the first time this had been done? It was done? the first time in primates. It had been done in rats, but, uh, but the first time in primates, uh, before the studies that proceeded from after that in humans, and so what we did was we would take the monkeys into the nuclear medicine department after, in the evening when there were any patients around because you couldn't bring monkeys in while patients were there. And so the monkeys would be sedated and wheeled from their housing uh, to, to, the, to the nuclear medicine, the clinical department, you know, the, where we did patients and did their, uh, their uptakes. Uh, so that and that was that was published in 1992, uh, with with Chris being obviously the lead author. And then, of course, we then the next human studies came out. I believe in 1994, uh, with a collaborative study, the first human trials of th the recombinant human TSH or thyrogen in humans to stimulate radioactive iodine uptake, and it was it's being used primarily. In the, uh, in the treatment of patients who have thyroid cancer in the, when they don't have their thyroids after thyroid surgery who are on replacement levothyroxine. You can inject thyrogen or the recombinant human TSH on Monday and Tuesday uh, without having to withdraw their thyroid hormone so that you're giving them exogenous TSH rather than endogenous TSH and then treat them on, on a Wednesday. It's also been used extensively in Europe uh, not so much in this country, 
uh, to treat non-toxic nodular goiter. So you inject the thyrogen to stimulate uptake in the thyroid and then treat the patients with radioactive iodine, which does reduce the size of the thyroids by about 40 to 50 percent. As a matter of fact, the most recent paper uh, that came, that uh, either is coming out or has come out, uh, describes uh, a, a different form of uh, a thyrogen, uh, which did about as well. It was expected it would do better, but it's equal to a little longer acting thyrogen or the common human TSH on stimulating thyroid uptake in, in, and treatment in patients with new thyroid non-toxic nodular goiter. Would you comment a little bit on the, that collaboration the, in general, maybe between academia and pharmaceutical industry and in uh, its development, production, and the application of? Uh, yeah, uh, I, yeah, I think this, yeah, I, I think this is a good example of collaboration between corporate pharmaceutical company or, a co or, or, or companies interested in medical, uh, either devices or medical products to bring it to the clinicians to investigate the, the efficacy and the usefulness of a product. And in this case, uh, it did, it, the amount of monies that were expended, at least for any individual uh, laboratory or any individual center, was very, very small relative. And I think it, it was a very, very good collaboration. I think Genzyme uh, has been a good, a good uh, clinical investigating arm uh, to the thyroid community, and uh, I think it, it's an example of the good that can come out of uh, the industry, industrial, academic, or industrial medical complex. Uh, I think, on the other hand, to be perfectly honest, I think that uh, in other areas uh, that there is some, not collusion, but some makes me nervous uh, when companies become the major funders of, uh, of research, although with the NIH cutting back, this is the, probably going to be the future until the federal government and our Republican uh, colleagues wake up to the fact that medical research is far more important than sending advisors back into Iraq. Yay. Just, okay. what, what led to your studies on perchlorate? Uh, yeah. What is perchlorate? Well, perchlorate is an anion found in the environment uh, in, in minute and small quantities throughout our environment, both in the water supplies and in shale, and in, uh, it's, it's ubiquitous, essentially. Uh, and the question has come up in the past is perchlorate is an anion which is an inhibitor of the sodium iodide symporter, so that would decrease the entrance of iodine into the thyroid. As a matter of fact, in, it has been used in the past in pharmacologi pharmacological doses of about 200 milligrams every six to eight hours in the treatment of iodine-induced hyperthyroidism. Uh, those were in huge doses, but the big concern was that if it's present in the environment, could it act adversely on the thyroid? So there have been many studies done with some controversial results on the effects of uh, low-level perchlorate exposure, especially in pregnant women and in the, uh, in the newborn. How did it get into the environment? It get, it, it, it's unclear. The, well, there are many sources. Well, yeah. there's, a, there's an endogenous source that is just natural, but then there's also other sources such as fireworks, uh, the uh, bags, the uh, bags in cars, Air the bags. explosive airbags. Uh, also, the all of the rockets, and all of the fireworks, rockets. It's it's ubiquitous in that respect, in that it's needed. It's it's the oxidizing agent to cause explosions, and um, so that there was a in a lawsuit out on the west coast, Lockheed Martin and other companies which were making perchlorate for the use in, in, in rocket fuel uh, it leaked into the environment, into the water supply, and there was a class action suit in California uh, blaming Lockheed Martin and other companies for inducing thyroid cancer or hypothyroidism in patients 
probably, uh, I don't believe it's probably the case, but I believe it was settled finally. Uh, so that there has been a lot of concern about low level perchlorate, especially in pregnant women and in the developing fetus and in the newborn. Uh, do you have current or your more recent efforts in this area? Yeah, we, we had done studies uh, earlier with Jen Lawrence, who's now uh, practicing in Valdosta, Georgia, uh, a wonderful young woman. And uh, she, when I was at the Brigham, we gave perchlorate to, to, uh, to normal volunteers. And at uh, it, 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 high doses, it can decrease the uptake of iodine into the thyroid, but it had, at least in small studies, had no real effect on circulating hormones. That was for a short period of time, but there have been other environmental studies uh, from the uh, CDC which associated low-level perchlorate in the NHANES studies, National Health Survey studies, uh, res which might be responsible for some minor uh, lowering of the serum T4, especially in women, uh, and the slight elevations in serum TSH, indicative of the fact that there might be a mild effect on thyroid function from the environmental perchlorate exposure. We've done studies in pregnant women in, uh, in South America and in this country and in the, uh, and in the studies uh, uh, from the UK and Italy and uh, in pregnant women and have found no effect. However, it is controversial and uh, very recently our studies from Thailand with my colleague uh, Dr. Boonsong uh, very recently, uh, which will be published very shortly in the JCNM, uh, have shown a small but significant effect of low level perchlorate in 200 pregnant women on their uh, serum TSH, a little slight rise and a slight decrease in their free T4 levels. So that it is controversial. It wasn't seen in the large uh, UK study. Uh, so that I think that um, this has to be resolved. If there are changes, they're going to be very subtle. And it's very extremely expensive to eliminate perchlorate from the water supply. I mean, it's almost, almost it's extremely expensive. All, water, all drinking water supplies would have to be treated. And I don't know exactly how they do it, but it's expensive. And it's a, now become an issue, I think, in the Congress. So there's been a lot of action in perchlorate. Uh, and we have our laboratory is one of the few laboratories in the country now that are measuring perchlorate and thiocyanate, which is another uh, less potent inhibitor of, en of the entrance of iodine into the thyroid. And this is a byproduct of cigarette smoking. Uh, so that we, our laboratory is measuring perchlorate, thiocyanate, and iodine. Uh, on, on a large variety of studies that are ongoing at this time. So I think it, the question is still up in the air. Uh, it's probably one of the, probably be the second time that we made, uh, that our findings may be marginally uh, not confirmed in other studies, but that's okay. I mean, you know, it can't be 100% right, but I still think we're okay. But there, there may be some minimal effects. Uh, and I must say that this same sort of situation occurred when we uh, originally had said that the deiodinase, the type 3 deiodinase in the human placenta, the type 3 deiodinase is one of the deiodinases that inactivates uh, T4 into uh, reverse T3, that we had originally, uh, for instance, said that it was not a selenoprotein because we had placed rats on low, low levels of selenium in their diet took out their placentas in the pregnant rats. And we found both in rats and in humans uh, no change in the inner ring deiodinase, however, and suggested therefore that the type three, the inner ring deiodinase was not a selenoprotein, but it's been confirmed that it is a selenoprotein. So, you know, that's life. That's you can't science. be right all the time. That's and science, right? Yeah, that's science. And I think, you know, looking back, I think maybe our, our rats uh, were not, uh, not completely selenium deficient. Mm -hmm. It's the only explanation I can think of, and yet we kept them, th we had two or three generations of rats on a selenium deficiency. 
So that you know you win some and you lose some. You've served on editorial boards and endocrine journals and edited endocrine textbooks. Uh, you were editor-in-chief of the Journal of Clinical Endocrinology and Metabolism, and until last December, I think, you served as editor-in-chief of endocrine practice. Correct? Yes. Also, I'm editor, continuing to be editor of current opinion in endocrinology, diabetes, and, and nutrition. And you're also co-editor for a number of editions of Werner and Ingbar's The Thyroid. Correct. Okay. The last one, I think, about a year and a half ago, came out with uh, David Cooper as, as the new co-editor. You know, it's a, uh, I, I'm getting very nervous because I edited, co-edited the book with Sid Ingbar, and he's deceased. Then I co-edited the book with Bob Utica, and he's now deceased. And David Cooper is much younger than I am, so I'm getting very, very nervous. This might be the last edition, <laughs> I, I think. How often do they come out? About every five or six years. <laughs> so it definitely will be, as far as I'm concerned, will be the last edition. Uh, would you speak to the importance of serving as an editor and maybe some of the joys and sorrows you've experienced as being one? You know, I, as I think I had mentioned earlier, you know, one of the, one of the before the, uh, the, the video uh, re uh, taping, I think uh, in the old days when I was the editor of the JCNM, for example, there, wasn't, there were very, very little access to computers, and I had one full-time administrative person and a part-time administrative person and me, and that was the editorial office of the JCNM in the 80s. And one of the, I think one of the joys of doing it in those days, and it was a lot of work, but I had some great help. Uh, and the, edit, the uh, editorial board were certainly extremely useful and helpful. My co-editors co uh, were also very, very helpful. But one of, the, one of the things that I, looking back, comparing it to current journals, uh, all computerized and all mechanized, uh, in letters that, that we sent out to authors, there was a certain amount of form, formal letters, of course, they were in the mail, not on, not on, not on the computers. Uh, I tried to add, add a little personal note if, I had, if, the, if the paper was almost accepted but not quite, to make the authors feel as though, you know, that it wasn't all bad. And that just doesn't happen now. It's all form formalized, and I understand why. Uh, and I think it, it, gives, it, it gives the editor a little more personal touch to a journal. But times advance, and that's not the case anymore. I, you know, I think that most of the editors now try, but I think in this mechanized and computerized age, it's, it's just about impossible. And I think one of the other things is, and I think, uh, is the issue of double publications and falsifying of data, I think, is a major, major issue. And as you know now, there are some problems at the Harvard Medical School uh, about a couple of, of major findings which are now under investigation. So that I think that editors can't be policemen, but boy, when they find out that something's a remiss, uh, I, one, I remember one occasion when I was the editor of JCNM when there was a duplicate publication. Can you imagine the chutzpah of, of guys submitting a, patient, a paper to two journals, having accepted in both, and coming out closely related in time? So obviously that paper was withdrawn. But I think that there, I think there's a certain amount of, uh, of, of policing, but it's, uh, I hate to use that word, but it's very difficult. You can't tell. Most people, uh, 99 and 99, 100 percent are, are honest and straight, but it's the, it's the subtle changes uh, that, uh, that occur in, in writing and some of the changes that are made in graphs and things that are very disturbing, but they're in a minority. I think being an editor uh, of, of, of a journal gives you also an opportunity to improve the publications, to make them better. And the reviewers play a major role in that. And I, so I think that it's a lot of work. But I, I think it's probably, volume-wise, much more work now than it was then. 
On the other hand, I think in, for an individual editor, it was more work then than it is now because we had to do more of the the day-by-day the, the -day labor. So that, uh, but it's always been, as, when I was editor of JCNM, it was nothing but a, a, joyful, a joyful experience. And in, and in the editing of being the editor-in-chief of, uh, of Endo Practice, uh, which I just completed after seven years, as you mentioned, this last December, was also a, a, a wonderful experience. And I, I, we tried our best to improve the impact factor, if you will, of journals. You know, the impact factor is only something of relatively modern. In, in other, in olden, not olden times, but in the 80s and 90s, and there's no such thing as impact factor. And I think that it is a, I think in a way, it's a bit of a curse. And I think that editors and everybody else is so, so obsessed with what the impact factor of a journal is, uh, not realizing that some outstanding papers are published in journals that have, don't have great impact factors. So. I think that's another change that didn't occur, uh, certainly when I was the editor of JC&M. I'm <laughs> afraid that I'm going to be doing it, I'll tell you that, because yeah, I, you know, I know about people who do it. And, and I, you're not, not, no big accent, but he said, you know, if, he was a tough guy. He said, you know, yeah. if I'm so senile that I don't know the difference between, that's it. And he stopped practicing. You he, were secretary of the American Thyroid Association from 70, 1977 to 1983, and then you served as president uh, from 1984 to 85. What was the ATA like in those years? A big difference. Uh, in those days, and my dad, my father-in-law, was a thyroid guy, a physician. He was a, a professor at Harvard Medical School toward the end of his career. And uh, he was one of the founding members. It used to be called the American Goiter Association. And then they switched. It was a surgical organization at the beginning because most of the thyroid, obviously th surgery was the major issue, the major treatment before antithyroid drugs became available. Uh, but at any rate, I, you know, I, I think it was a small organization in those days. There were 300 members. There were no, ab no uh, posters. All of the presentations were oral and only about 40% of the abstracts were accepted. So that it was a really an elite, small organization, a wonderful group. And uh, when I was a secretary, I had a one part-time person, and that was all. And now the ATA office is, is wonderful, big, huge, functioning, extremely well. No, as near as big as the Endocrine Society home office, but it was different in those days. It was a mom and pop show, really. And uh, we knew everybody, uh, if there were only 300 members, you knew you'd, you'd know almost everybody. Uh, now, as the organization has grown, it's still a, a friendly, wonderful organization, but it's much bigger with a big staff, bigger staff. So the being secretary uh, was, as a matter of fact, a lot of the presidents said that there's no point in being president because the secretary was running everything anyway. So I'm not sure that was a direct slam at me, but we, we <laughs> well, you tried. you were secretary too, though. So. Pardon? You had been secretary too. Though. Right. So, and then uh, the, I was president when they, were, they had the uh, international meeting in Brazil in 1985 in Sao Paulo. That was when my presidency year. And, and, uh, and you know, I was on the council for a while. It's a wonderful organization. And, and uh, now, the, the the association established the annual Louis E. Braverman Lectureship Award in uh, 2011. Uh, would you talk a little bit about that honor? Uh, that was a complete shock and surprise. I knew nothing about it. Uh, Jen Lawrence, uh, 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 Alan Farwell, Elizabeth Pierce, and uh, Vin Tamprika. All of them uh, had either been, uh, all of the three of them had been former fellows of mine, and, the, uh, and Vin was a junior, fa junior uh, had completed his fellowship in bone um, disease at Boston Medical Center. Unbeknownst to me, the four of them got together. And I think Jen Lawrence, who's now the Valdoster uh, young woman, uh, was the spearhead, but they all did an amazing job. I knew nothing about it. So it was like a surprise? It was a complete surprise. surprise yeah, it was a surprise party, really. And I remember it was uh, at our endocrine, weekly endocrine 
case presentation rounds and guest lecture rounds at, at, at Boston Medical Center, uh, they just said, you know, they wheeled out this whole thing of the plaque and everything and said there's now an established uh, lectureship in your honor. I was overwhelmed with 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 almost uh, weeping, and I was so happy and 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 appreciative. I was, and these were the young people. You know, the mo most of the contributors had been people that I had been involved with closely, and and my family, my two sons, and I. Uh, couldn't even after you know me after the fact, but it was a it's a wonderful honor, and uh, it's one of the few. I think it's probably one of the few. Uh, lectures, at least for the ATA, is the only lecture where the name, the person is named after, is still around to go <laughs> to the meeting to hear the talk. And I have nothing to do with who uh, who is the speaker. That's picked by committee. So the four the four leaders, I really owe a debt of gratitude, and I was overwhelmed, obviously, with that honor. So, would you talk about your philosophy or style of mentoring? I think that one of the major reasons for being in academic medicine is to how to mentor. And you know, the young people are looking. They're looking for help. They're looking for direction. And I think that so many programs and so many leaders of fellowship programs or those involved with training fellows are really not devoting enough time to spend with their with the fellows and the trainees and helping them to get good jobs or as as good a job as is available at the time that they're finished so it, and it's a it's a sort of a two-way street because in my at least in my experience over these since 1962 is a long time 50 what 52 years of, of having fellows uh, one of the joys of, of having fellows is to work with them and to help them. They need help, especially nowadays where academic medicine is under the gun as far as finances are concerned. So that I think it's the role, it's our, it's our obligation, it's our role, our joy to help the young people uh, wend their way through what they're going to be when they get to be older people. When they finish their fellowship, where are they going to go? And when they're in their, during their fellowship, they need to meet with you. You have to help them. You have to nurture them like you would your, 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 your own kids, as a matter of fact. So that it's been, it's been probably, of all the things I've done, probably has given me the most pleasure to see the young people, those who do well. And they all do well, but it's a question of who stays in academic medicine and who doesn't. And those who stay in academic medicine, hopefully, continue to do well. And those in practice have learned how to be good physicians as well as uh, understanding the intricacies of, of their subspecialty. So mentoring, I think, is, a, is probably a major, the major role that senior physicians in academic medicine should, should do. It's an obligation. I'd like to ask you a little bit about the Endocrine Society. You've been a very active uh, member. You received its Robert H. William, uh, Williams Distinguished Leadership Award, and you served on the council, as well as on numerous committees. Uh, maybe just say something about how you've seen the growth of the Endocrine Society uh, and your assessment of that growth. Yeah, I think I can remember the days of the Endocrine Society, uh, when it was a much smaller organization, primarily Interestingly enough, uh, catering to the, to the academic endocrinologist so that the meetings in, in the old days uh, were, were primarily scientific and not sufficient effort was put into having the me national meetings, portions of it, if not minor, minor or major portions of the meeting being devoted to guys and uh, women who were in practice. And I, so I think over the last 15, 20 years, the Endocrine Society has done a, a wonderful job in making their annual meetings and making their journal, the JCNM, as well as their, their other more scientific journals, uh, more amenable to help the clinicians. And so I think that there's been an evolution in the Endocrine Society, and I think it, 
I think one of the reasons for the evolution is the founding of the, of the American Association of Clinical Endocrinologists, which in a way became, was founded, I believe, uh, by some very, very outstanding uh, uh, endocrinologists, primarily because they felt that the endocrine society was not paying enough attention to the clinical endocrinologists, the guys out in practice, the guys who were seeing the patients. And uh, so that I think when that happened, it, over the course of the years following that, I think there's been an evolution. And I think the Endocrine Society now is certainly fulfilling its obligation of not only uh, catering to top-notch, cutting-edge science, but also having a good portion of their national meeting and their journal. Uh, all their journals uh, at least have a, a more clinical bent. So that I think that's all for the good. Um, you know, if you look back in the old days, the endocrine society, the leadership, uh, there, were, there were no clinicians really in the leadership roles, and now there are. The, the role of women uh, has completely changed. Uh, the, American the American Thyroid Association and the Endocrine Society had very few women, not only as members, but in leadership roles, but look now. Uh, it, it's, a, it's become much more balanced. Uh, and so that I think that's all for the good. And as a matter of fact, in our fellowship now, in our endocrine fellowship, we have seven fellows that are all women this year. And they're all gonna be women next year. And uh, so that I think that it, endocrinology is becoming a, a field of, not primarily uh, for women, but it, a lot of women are interested in it. And I think for a good reason, it's, a, it's an intellectual, and you don't have to be running in in the middle of the night uh, and, uh, to take care of patients. And that, that gives the women an opportunity to do other things as well. So that I'm so pleased uh, that it's switched, but it, it's really switched completely now. As I said, we have, this year, we have all women fellows, beginning in July, another two weeks, all women, which is, which is good. What are your current views of the field, endocrinology or thyroidology, your, your choice? Yeah, I, I think it, let, I, we can go to thyroidology first. I, I think that it, it is blended, it's blended much more into both basic and clinical. I probably will not be a fan of many of my friends and colleagues in the ATA or in the Endocrine Society. I think that there is a far too great an emphasis on thyroid cancer. And if you look at the Endocrine Society meetings and certainly the American Thyroid Association annual meeting, uh, it, it is overwhelmingly in areas the most, uh, the most presentations and certainly the most interest for a disease which is uh, supposedly increasing in, in, in frequency, which might partially be due to in, more detection uh, but uh, I think it's overwhelmed some of the meetings and has pushed other areas of, of endocrinology uh, and the thyroid aspects of endocrinology a little bit into the background. But that, you know, things wa wax and wane, pendulum swings. So I suspect that that will not be the case in another 10 or 15 years. There'll be something else that'll wet everyone's fancy. But I think, uh, I think in the area of the basic science that's being done now in thyroidology and, and endocrinology in general is so different from when we trained and what we knew and probably know uh, to the good. I mean, they're getting to the mechanism of disease, the molecular biology, the, the bringing the science to the bedside has much improved over the last 15 years compared to what it was when those of us who started out primarily doing physiology. Okay, thank you. You're welcome, thank you so much.